I want to be able to hear God and not because I'm preoccupied. Going me! You gotta be willing to do what God tells you. I just simply want to title this message, Nothing But Prayer. In other words, some things are never ever going to change until you pray. Some things in your life today are waiting for you to pray. In Matthew 17, it goes like this in verse number 14. And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him kneeling down to him saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely. For he he often falls into a fire and often into water. This demon, this spirit drives him to suicide or depression, wants to destroy and kill his life. So I brought him to your disciples, but watch this. They could not cure him. I brought him to your followers, and they couldn't help him. I brought someone demon-possessed with devils to the church, and he couldn't find no help there. He goes on, he says, And Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him. And the child was cured that very hour. Look at this. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out. Look at Jesus doesn't have to pray long prayers. Some people think that the longer the prayer, the the louder the prayer, the more effective the prayer. Notice what Jesus prayed. He rebuked the demon, and it came out. In front of Lazarus' tomb, he says, Lazarus, come forth. You don't have to pray long prayers to be effective. And Jesus rebuked the demon. It came out of him. The child was cured that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately, not publicly, and said, watch this, why could we not cast it out? Why is there failure in our lives? Why are our marriages failing? Why are our children failing? Why are we failing as a church in our communities as a witness for Jesus Christ? Why is there failure? Why are we not accomplishing anything? So Jesus said, because of your unbelief, for I surely say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer. Some things are never going to change until we pray. Some things are never going to be different until we pray. Some things are never going to be fixed, repaired until we pray. In the original manuscript, it added the word fasting there. I have no problem with the word fasting because I believe in fasting according to Isaiah 58. But the original manuscript, it just ends at prayer. This kind, if you want this kind of results in your life, then it's going to come through a prayerful life. I don't know about you. In this hour that we're living in today, I don't believe that we need less prayer. I I think we need more prayer. When ISIS is waging war around the world, and Bruce, I mean Caitlyn Jenner, is, one, is woman of the year by Glamour magazine. We need more prayer. If more books are written on the marriage, but yet there are more divorces and infidelity, we need more prayer. If children who are raised in the church no longer want anything to do with God, I think we need more prayer, not less prayer. When people are more on prescription drugs and medications to deal with depression, fear, and discouragement, and anxiety, and stress, I think we need more favor. When people are addicted to porn, we need more prayer. When people come to church late and they leave church early, we need more prayer. When Christians are afraid to share their faith with other people, we need more prayer. We need more prayer. 
when we complain that the services are too long, yet we'll spend hours in front of a television, a movie theater, shopping, eating at a restaurant, on the phone, and on the internet. We need more prayer when the Bible does not become the standard of our choices and our decisions or our morals, or our values, or our integrity. But it's what we feel and what we want dominates our choices and decisions. We need more prayer when a coach invites players at the end of the game to come to the middle of the field for a word of prayer, and he's threatened if he doesn't stop, he'll be fired. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, as I talk about prayer changing things, and that nothing, nothing is going to happen differently. This world is going to get worse. This world is going to progressively get worse until we pray. I don't know why, but it's so that an omnipotent God, which simply means an all-powerful God, omnipotent God, excuse me, has chosen to limit himself to this vehicle called prayer. God will do nothing and can do nothing until someone prays and welcomes and invites an all-powerful God into this world. And it says this, if my people which are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, watch this, prayer changes things. Then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive them their sins, and I will heal their land. Prayer changes things. Some things are not going to happen until we pray. The Bible says in James 5, 16, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man as well as a woman he says, makes tremendous power available. This power is available to all of us. When we are fighting the demons and devils of this world, just like Mark says when he describes the condition, foaming at the mouth, gnashing, it is terrible. He says, dynamic in its working prayer. And then in Jeremiah 33, 3, call unto me and I will answer thee. And I will show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. I want you to recognize prayer will change. A no way, no how, impossible, never going to happen. Hopeless, helpless, un unworkable, over finished, denied, done, nope, and never situation. God can turn it around through prayer. Who would ever have thought that this fledgling church over 21 years ago with 12 people in a house that was 970 square feet would arise to where it's at today? The church grew not because of the preaching. The church grew not because of the building. The church did, didn't grow because of the children program and youth ministry, singles and women's fellowship and men, because we didn't offer any of that back then. It didn't grow because of the music or the choir, because we did not have any of that. The number one reason why this church grew was because it was founded upon prayer. From day one, we instituted Friday night prayer. And that little band of people would gather together and we'd cry out for God to give us a vision. The name Abundant Living Family Church was birthed out of that prayer night. The vision to seek the lost, teach the found, and send the disciples was birthed out of that prayer night. Somewhere along the lines, maybe I lost my way. Maybe I got caught up in the assets and the building and the numbers and the people. And not purposefully, but ministry and the demands of ministry and everybody wanting this and this to go on within the church kind of overshadowed prayer. But I thank God like a phoenix rising out of the ground, God is reestablishing this church. And you will not like this church if you don't want to pray and seek God. And I'm really prayerful right now, asking God, God, this is going to end. I'm going to, one, one weekend, I'm going to move on to another subject. But help me to keep, as we keep worship important here in the preaching of the word, prayer before the people. Okay, one of my scriptures that really leads my life is Romans 12, 12, and it is be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. And the reason that that scripture really speaks to me is because I feel like it's applicable to every area of your life. Um, I think that hope is something that we really need to strive for, and I think that a lot of times when I'm going through something or something's hard or challenging, I think that I need to remember the joy and why I have hope and why I have my faith, so be joyful in hope. That's 
why that's really important to me. The second part is patient during affliction because we're always going to have troubles, trials, tribulations um, in our lives, struggles and challenges um, that really come for growth of us. Um, but I feel like we do need to be patient during those, those times and really just live through the journey and the situations um, to bring us through. And then the last part of that scripture is really be faithful in prayer. And that's really important to me because my prayers really are kind of just conversations with God. I just kind of talk to him. I don't have like a ritual or I have to say this before that in my prayers. I just talk to him like, I would, like I'm talking to you. Um, you know, God, this is what's going on in my life and I don't understand what I need to do. I need direction, Lord, or, you know, I'm just talking to him and I was thanking him about things. So that's why that scripture really speaks to my life. So be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. And that's my word from the street. You know, I don't know if you've ever been infested or a home, you're going to buy a home with termites. Termites. I mean, you could go and get some uh, spray at Home Depot and begin to spray around your house, and maybe you're going to kill some of the termites, and maybe you get some some powder and pray it, put it along the base of your home, and maybe that's going to stop some termites. But if you are infested with termites, you're going to have to get the tent. You're going to have to bring the tent. So, I, mean, I don't want the tent. I just want the spray at Home Depot. I want the quick. Listen, the tent is inconvenience. That means I've got to move out of my house. That means that smell is going to be all over the place. Listen, if you want to get rid of the termites, the only way to get rid of the termites is you got to buy the tent. And the only way to get rid of some stuff in your life is prayer. There's no other alternative. You can't go to Home Depot and just buy the instant stuff. How many of you know there's only one way to get rid of constipation? What comes in you, baby's got to come out of you. I'm sorry. And sometimes there's only one way to get what's in you that's been in you for years that maybe happened to you at five years old or happened to you six years ago or last year. That attitude, that stubbornness, that grudge, that pride, that unforgiveness, that haughtiness is rooted down in there. And the, oh, it's like a demon. It's like a devil here. And it's not going to leave the first time. It's going to oppose you. It's going to stand against you. It's not going to be moved by certain things in your life. And the only way to get that out of you, I don't know what's in you, but the only way to get it out of you, the bad stuff, the stronghold stuff, is you got to pray it out. And the only way to get the good stuff out of you, peace and joy and this ministry, this calling, this obedience to God, it's got to be prayed out of me. And I hope that you're in that place today. You know, I'm tired of my marriage struggling. I'm tired of my finances struggling. I'm tired of my health struggling. I'm tired of struggling with alcohol. I'm tired of struggling with drugs. I'm tired of struggling with pornography. I'm tired of struggling with this anger. I am tired of being rejected and denied. One of the most famous shot blockers is a guy named Matumbo. He's the one that shakes his finger when you come in his way. He rejects it. Oh, no, not today. No, 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 no. And that's what the devil does to you. Boom, slaps you back. You're not going to get a blessed marriage. You're never going to get healed. You're never going to get delivered. Who do you think you are? Boom, slaps you back. And you got to say, I'm tired of being rejected. I'm tired of coming to church and my life has not changed. I'm tired of reading my Bible, and I'm not getting the results. And bless God, I want change. Why? See, it's not until you get restless will you get the answer. Do you have the guts to ask God why you're in the situation you're in? I'll be honest with you. Some of us don't have the guts to ask him why. Some of us don't really want to know why because we know the answer. We just, we just presume, presume our marriages will always be blessed. We just presume we'll always have money in the bank account. We just presume we'll always have a job. We'll presume that our children are always going to be blessed. And we stop praying. We slow down. We don't have the passion because there's not great desperation or need in our lives. So I could get away with a 30-second prayer or I could get away with not praying. 
I'm going to ask you right now to make a commitment to God for the rest of your life. And the commitment to God for the rest of your life is this. Here we go. No days off when it comes to prayer. Now listen, this is what I did. I didn't, ask, I didn't tell you how long to pray. I'm not concerned how long you pray. But I am challenging you today for this moment. For I care if you're on vacation or you're sick, no days off. So if that, if that means a 10-second prayer, check it off. You did it. You prayed that day. I don't care. But I'm going to challenge you to create this lifestyle and culture. I take no days off when it comes to prayer. Five people are taking the challenge. The rest of you don't know what to do. <laughs> prayer is not something you used to do. Prayer is something you continue to do. I'm going to put this on just to kind of give you a little bit of an illustration. Now, don't get scared on me or anything like that. My gun is turned around that way, but anyways. We need to be prayerful, which means you need to be ready. Because sometimes you don't know when you're going to get an unexpected phone call. Sometimes you're not going to know when the bomb went off. But it can happen. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. I never know when I'm going to hear something unexpectedly. I never know when I'm going to get a phone call and someone says, get to the hospital now. I never know when I'm going to go to work and find out that I got laid off, fired. I never know when the phone call is going to ring about my children or my grandchildren. I never know when my spouse is going to say, I've had enough. So I want to be ready when those times come. I, I don't want, where the heck is my gun? Where do I, where's, the, where's, the, where's the bullets? Where, where, where's the bullet? Shoot, I'm ready, sucker. Where are you at? Come on. What do you need? Healing? What do you need? Deliverance? What do you need? Comfort? What do you need? Provision? Where's that demon of lust? Where's that demon of pornography? Where's that demon of homosexuality? Where's that demon of gay rights? Where's that demon stronghold? Prayed up, ready. Ready for anything. Ready. How quickly? How quickly? I grew, I grew up with a cartoon character. His name was Quick Draw McGraw. Fastest gun in the West, quick draw. Man, he could pull that gun. That's the way your prayer needs to be. Pew, pew. When the cares, when the adversities, when the troubles, when the emer- pew, got that foot, got that cover, pew, got that cover, got that, pew, 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 got that cover. Not looking for the gun, panicking for the gun. Where are the, where are the daggone bullet? Where are you? Listen, a sign that you are prayed up is how long it takes you to respond in prayer to that emergency. Watch what I'm saying. Watch what I'm saying. Watch what I'm saying. So, you're at work, and you hear that there's ISIS terrorism in Paris. How long did it take you to pray? Tells me if you're prayed up. When you heard... That Molly was under attack. How long did it take you to pray? When someone asked you, would you pray for someone, how long has it taken you to pray for them? When you saw an accident on a freeway, when you were watching the news, you heard of it, how long did it take you to pray? If it wasn't, that tells me you're not prayed up because prayer is not on your agenda. You know, I'm so burnt out. I am so tired. How can I pray for someone else when I need prayer myself? See, your response. Okay, let me give you another analogy. Okay. There is a major accident right now on the 210 freeway. A semi has rear-ended a smart car right now. A passerby calls 911. Help now. Okay. Let's see how long it takes for the ambulance, the policeman, or the fireman to show up. 30 seconds, three minutes, three hours, three days, three weeks. They are dead. Do you realize that some people under your watch, it's life and death when that comes to you, and how quickly you respond will determine life or death. And I believe God is challenging us today. The reason why you can't respond is because there's nothing in the reserves.
If you are experiencing a hopeless situation or simply desire prayer, please feel free to give us a call. We are here because we care. It's time to get real. Come as you are. Unbelief in our lives stops our prayers from, from being effective and, and having us to be victorious over the works of the devil. Whatever they look like in our lives, whatever suffering looks like, whatever devastation looks like, whatever disaster looks like, it's our unbelief. We got to get the unbelief out of our lives. So listen, preacher, you're talking the wrong person. I believe in Jesus Christ. He is Lord and Savior. That's not the kind of belief he's talking about here. So let's talk about it. Here's what unbelief is. Unbelief in the description, this is my definition of unbelief. Unbelief is just simply this. Unbelief is making choices and decisions without consulting Jesus. That's unbelief. So I'm marrying people that I want to marry. I'm buying things I want to buy. I'm going places where I want to go. I'm not saying you have to pray about everything, but I'm talking about major things in your life. You're doing them independent of him. That's a form of unbelief. The Bible says, acknowledge him in all my ways. I'm not acknowledging him. So I'm making decisions and choices without consulting him. That's unbelief. The second kind of unbelief is, is impurity in our lives, not living holy. The conversations and the words that we freely say out of our mouths. You know that person, they're, they're, who do they think they are? You know, like a Charlie Brown movie. So when, when, when it's time to get a hot prayer down and cast out a devil and get an answer, you ain't getting no results. Booyah by my tumble. Slaps you down. You got unbelief in your life. You got, you're, you're living an impure life. Hanging around people, watching things, doing things. You're, you got no power in your life. So he slaps you down. I ain't going nowhere. The third area of unbelief is our inability to trust God with the things that we care about the most. The Bible says the cares of this world choke the word of God. Trust the Lord with all thy heart. And if I can't even trust God with my time, that's, that is unbelief. You aren't going to be able to cast nothing out. Matumbo is going to block you. You're not going to have victory over the enemy in some area of your life because I have an inability to trust God in areas that matter the most. And I let the cares, worries, and fears of this world dominate me. And the last point here is this. Your greatest, watch this, your greatest revelations are not going to come in a crowd your greatest revelations are going to come when you're alone with Jesus. The Bible says, blessed, Matthew 5, 6, blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Okay? The Bible says this. They were in the midst of a multitude. It's, it's a lot of commotion. It's a lot of noise. Everyone's looking at the disciples. The spirit is convulsing. He's throwing on the floor. They say, come out in Jesus' name. The spirit doesn't come out. They feel rejected. They feel disappointed. They're, 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 they're getting full of fear. They're, they're, things are overwhelming for them. And then Jesus comes, and, and, and he casts out the spirit. The boy is instantly set free. They, Jesus walks away with his disciples. They're sitting down, and they say, I, I, I don't want a piece of bread. I don't want no water. Tell me why we failed. What did we do wrong? The greatest revelations, the greatest experiences, the greatest truths are not going to come in a crowd. They're going to come when you get alone and sit down with Jesus. And Jesus, okay, now you want to know? Because God doesn't talk in crowds. Crowds are too noisy. God doesn't talk in crowds because there's too, too many distractions. God does not talk in crowds because you can be influenced by a crowd. God said, but when you get alone with me, that's when truth will be revealed to you. Now I will answer your why. Some of you have whys. In your, why did this happen? Until you get alone with Jesus, you'll never know why. He'll bring the revelation and he'll bring the truth. Questions.
that weigh heavy in our hearts can only come when you get alone with Jesus, not in a crowd. But notice it is their desperation and it is their restlessness that causes them to get the answer. And until you are restless, I'm tired of being rejected and denied. I'm tired of not getting the results I want. I'm tired of not getting the answers. There's got to be a restlessness within you. If this is all there is to Christianity, if this is all there is to coming to church, you are on the right road when you start getting restless. But when you are unconcerned and don't care, then you're probably not going to seek God and you're not going to be full of prayer. Come along, children. Now we're going to have a little music. There's people in this world that are living the lifestyle they're living. They don't know better. Today's message touched your heart in a real way, and you're ready to commit to a real relationship with Christ. Don't hesitate. Call us toll free at 1 877 566 Real. You can also visit us at realwithdiegomesa.org. Choice is yours. Come as flipping crazy and jacked up and messed up as you want. I just finished doing a marriage behind me and coming to faith in Jesus Christ, giving your heart to him, is like marrying Jesus. He's like the groom who took the first step. That first step was to die for you on the cross. And then he, now he knocks upon your heart and asks you to accept the marriage proposal of eternal life. The Bible says if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away and all things become new. That's what Christianity is. It is a relationship of fellowship and intimacy. It's a union that only you and him will share. Some people might think you're not marriage material because you know what? You have sin in your life. You've done some terrible things. You, you cheated on God in times past. I just want you to know he reaches out with his love and forgiveness today. Would you open your heart and accept his love and forgiveness by saying, I'm a sinner? Jesus, will you come and live in my heart? And Jesus, today, I want to marry you. I want you to be my Lord and Savior. God bless you. This is your wedding day. Welcome to the kingdom of God. You gotta be willing to do what God tells you.